True Love Chapel 173 in the book of Matthew chapter 13. This is the parable of the net. Let's pray. God Almighty, please bless this sermon. Please strengthen your church. Build us up. We pray in the name of Jesus. Help us to learn from you, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, I was just making a uh, video here for YouTube for this uh, called a vlog, video blog, if you want to go that route. And uh, great sermon. I was just preaching Sermon 173 for YouTube. And then right in the last final seconds of it, something strange happened. My phone uh, just turned off. And you got to wonder about these things. We know that uh, YouTube and Google is against Christians. Did they cut me off? Is that what happened, Google? Well, <clears throat> um, yeah. Okay, so here I'm trying again. Let's make it happen again. Um, frustrating. Of course, you know, we don't need social media, actually. Uh, we just throw it up here, these ones, because uh, they do give us unlimited bandwidth, usually. How many gigabytes have I posted to Google over the years? But, uh, yeah. Let's leave it at that. I don't know. Maybe it was my phone that just had a problem. I was just recording this on my phone, just very casually. Let's look in the book, try to get through this. It says, uh, the parable of the net. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and stored the good into containers, but threw the, away the bad. So shall it be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So yeah, that's the kind of hell that maybe people over at Google or YouTube, they don't want you to know about. That um, by following the course of the world, that you are headed straight for hell. They don't want you to know that because they're actually themselves being led by the devil and I know that's a, that's a, that may shock you some of you to hear but maybe not maybe we already know the social media the Facebook the Twitter the Google the Apple the you name it okay all the powerful uh, companies everything in the world I believe that they are under the influence of the devil and uh you know, the course of the world, the prince of the power of the air. And so they probably made their fortune, their vast fortunes, by submitting to the devil. Whether they know it or not, that's what I'm saying. They might know it or they might not. But uh, here we are looking at the kingdom of heaven. In, the, in this case, you know, the net is thrown in the sea, gathered fish of every kind. And then they were sorted and uh, divided up. The good were saved and then the, the bad were thrown away. And that's how it'll be uh, on earth with people. And so the, the good, the saved, and the unsaved, they're, they're going to be together till the, till the end, till the judgment. And that God will judge everyone. Um, So as much as the, you know, the world seems to hate Christians nowadays, um, they want to get rid of us, saying we're the problem, uh, saying that we're intolerant and things like that. When they're actually, they don't come across as being very tolerant of Christian views. Um, even though every single worldview on the planet is a, is a self-contradiction, it's self-refuting. Um, except for one, except for Christianity. Christianity is the only worldview that cannot be refuted. Uh, it's truth. So what do you have against the truth? And what do you have against love? That's, that's the world. That's the, uh, how ridiculous the world is. 
And, um, but yeah, we need to keep in mind about this, about hell is that it's not a fun place that, you know, to be separated from God, God is good. And to be separated from God from all eternity would be, um, the absence of anything good to be completely desperate, hopeless, uh, complete agony, the opposite of peace, love, joy, um, and comfort and well-being. It would be absolute pain and agony for all eternity. And so that's, that's how serious it is. And, um, and, and we should not be okay with that as Christians who know the truth who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. We need to share that. Um, whether people like it or not, whether they accept it or not, that's another question. That's on them. But, you know, we need to keep be ta keep talking to people um, about it and keep, keep spreading this gospel. Um, I was saying that... Uh, the, uh, you know, in, in Proverbs 1, it says, like, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or of, of knowledge. And, um, and it's that fear of the Lord is it be, it comes from knowing that he is going to judge everything. He's going to judge the world. And uh, and he's the one who decides your, your fate for all eternity. So he's the one you have to please. And that's, that's ultimately what matters in life that's the one thing that really matters is god approved does god approve of you or not are you thrown into the the fiery furnace or are you thrown are you saved that's your ultimate you know everything else is secondary to that so if you're going to make it if your life is going to count for something you have to be counted as one of the good ones and um So exactly how how can that happen? We look in Romans one. Actually, I do want to turn in Romans one. It talks about uh, God's wrath on unrighteousness, from verse eighteen. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Skip down. Uh, to verse 28 and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done in Romans 1 it's talking about everyone knows God we can see it through the things he's made through the creation I mean it doesn't it's it's obvious actually it's self-evident that it, without God nothing could exist and um yeah, you can measure that in the sciences, and you can also just know it in your in your soul, really. Um, and then certain things like universal morality. Um, you know, we we as a human species know that it is wrong to kill and to destroy, and that it's right to care for some someone. Um, we know that that's self-evident that's universal and in order for there to be a universal self-evident law of morality there needs to be a lawgiver and that lawgiver of course is god and also i mean there's a number of arguments um for the existence of god the moral argument what i just mentioned there's the uh, cosmological argument which which is about everything that was created has a creator so um now god wasn't created he's eternal he's existed forever as father son and holy spirit but everything else has been created 
the, the sciences can tell us that the universe is not eternal. It is expanding and it's cooling and it is definitely not eternal. In fact, they tell us it came from something called the Big Bang and just exploded into being. And that before that, there was absolutely no time, space, or matter. Not even time, not even empty space, and certainly not matter. So all those things just, poof, came into being. And, um, and so everything that was created was created by something, by a creator. And um, that's the cosmological argument. And um, it's, it is also a self-evident type argument. Um, it's, if you say there's no God, then you're saying all time, space, and matter simply exploded into being um, with no cause and for no reason. And that's absolutely impossible. Nothing cannot create something. Nothing does not have creative power at all so that's that's self uh self refuting uh philosophical naturalism is self refuting then you have the the teleological argument which points to how all of creation is fine-tuned for the existence of human life from its very moment of creation so all of the uh physical laws of science um, were set in place from the very moment of creation, from big, the Big Bang, to fine-tune the universe f to support human life, and to even go a step further to support human life and to make um, the creation know knowable and observable to mankind. So all the laws of physics and everything can be written in mathematical formulas on a single piece of paper. That's incredibly amazing right there that something so complex can be summarized through mathematical formulas so simple or the fact that we're exactly where we need to be the distance between here and the the sun of course is perfect for us to have perfect weather to have support life we have the moon at the exact place it needs to be to give us the full lunar eclipse or the full solar eclipse rather and the solar eclipse was necessary um, for to confirm some of Einstein's theories about the way uh, relativity and the way gravity works, that it was actually space itself bending around matter, such as the, the moon. You know, they could actually observe space-time bending in, in a full eclipse like that. And so that was an important discovery that was possible because the moon just so happened to be exactly right there. They say if the speed of light was off by one and <laughs> like 10 to the power of, <laughs> don't, don't even get me started. I don't even know how many zeros that is. If the uh, speed of light was off by a tiny fraction like that, then no uh, life could exist. But there would not even, so, so you can go on and on and on about these things, about the exact way. Um, and talk about a perfect storm. They say all things lined up together to create a human life and to create a human that can observe the world around us. You know, the exact position we are in the, the galaxy and to where we can see straight into the Milky Way galaxy from where we are. It didn't have to be that way. It could have been covered with space dust and debris. But no, we have a clear view straight into the, the, ga the center of the galaxy. It's amazing. And, and so that kind of goes back to what Romans 1 was talking about, that we can see the things that God has made. And, uh, and so that we're not, uh, we don't have an excuse for, for saying that there's no God. Now, if you reject God, and you do that, then, uh, you know, typically you'll have many chances usually, but over and over you keep rejecting God. God eventually, he gives you over to your choice to reject him. And that would be giving you over to the debased mind, the depraved mind, the one that cannot differentiate between good and evil because, um, 
you've rejected God for so long that God just confirms you in your choice. And so you've lost your, your conscience. Um, and, and that's a sad, sad thing. On the other hand, if you respond well, respond favorably to the, the light of revelation that God has given you, then he will give you more light. And he will uh, make himself known to you. And if you uh, draw near to him, he will draw near to you. And you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he will manifest himself to you through his Holy Spirit and to your spirit directly. And you'll have fellowship with him. So it's just like that. And um, obviously heaven, I mean, heaven is, is uh, absolutely great. And uh, hell being the opposite, absence of anything good. So, yeah. So here's the dilemma then. Is that uh, we, let's say you realize that you know that you, you want to go to, to heaven. You don't want to go to hell. You want to be counted among the good. You know that God's going to judge um, for you to have that thought, the Holy Spirit has to reveal it to you. You wouldn't arrive at it on your own. Um, we're not capable of coming to God on our own, but God has to invite us. He invites us, and He does invite everyone, but not everyone uh, responds well. They, they tend to reject the, uh, the Spirit calling, but He invites us by, with, through the Holy Spirit calling us. And if you respond to that, then um, um, typically you respond to the, the little bit of light you have. God gives you more. But you can respond, you know, deciding that you want to go to heaven is, is a good place to start. But you have to realize that you're a sinner. You know, if you ask most people, how do you make it to heaven? They say, well, you got to be a good person. Okay, well, how good is good? God's standard is absolutely, absolute perfection. He's completely 100% holy. God says, be holy for I am holy. So he demands perfection from us. He cannot stand to have um, any imperfection to come into heaven in his presence for eternity. So that has to be dealt with. And um, God's standard is, is actually impossibly high. You know, most people would say, oh, okay, I'm, I haven't really killed anyone. I haven't committed any huge um, hor horrific acts. So I'm basically a good person. So they think that they'll be okay. Well, it's not like that at all. Um, first of all, uh, you know, if you're saved, it means you know God and you don't have to think you're going to be okay. You know, experience directly God himself now in this life, in this existence. But um, his standard is impossibly high that no person can, can obtain it. Um, <clears throat> all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And the sin means you've missed the mark. You've fallen short. And uh, once you, you have to realize that, that you've made mistakes in the past, you're making mistakes now, you're going to make mistakes in the future, you're not perfect Okay, we sin out of our own nature. That um, um, it's not just that we're sinners because we sin, but we sin because we are sinners. That is our nature. Jesus Christ, uh, of course, didn't have that same nature uh, as us. He is uh, he is God, and in His nature is perfection. So that's what we're trying to obtain is that perfection, but we can't do it on our own. Um, as Paul was saying in Romans 7, you know, the good that I want to do, I don't do. And the bad that I don't want to do, that's what I do. So the struggle that we're having to do, you know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We want to do good. We want to be perfect, but we can't. We're not there. We can't. We just cannot do it. And God's standard is like I say, it's impossibly high for us to to uh, follow. Um, if we're guilty of breaking even one law, it'd be the same as if we broke the whole law. It's, and and so yeah, 
and God cares about the letter of law, also the spirit of the law. So it's like, there's absolutely no way. But you have to realize you're a sinner. And that sin, if you get, if God gives you what you deserve, you deserve death and you deserve hell for eternity. So, so what you need is a savior. That's what it comes down to. You need someone to save you from this helpless uh, conundrum that you're stuck in of wanting to, to do good, wanting to please God, but being unable to do so. Okay, so you need a savior. And um, of course, that savior is Jesus Christ. And what we do is we, we do repent of our old way of life and turn and turn away from that and turn to Jesus Christ as part of our, our salvation. But um, Jesus Christ himself is God incarnate, God in the flesh. And God is um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all of that is one God. And the God, the full deity of, of uh, God in the flesh, that's Jesus Christ. And so God wants to save us. He's, he's loving. He's merciful. He's... Uh, you know, there's no limit really to his mercy, but at the same time, there's no limit to his justice too. So, well, I don't say if there's a limit, but it's it's mercy and justice in perfection on on each. And so, sin needs to be punished. All the horrific atrocities that occurred in the world, they need to be dealt with. You know, it's not right for someone like Hitler to kill however many million people and then die in the arms of his mistress and never really be punished for it. You know, that needs to be dealt with in one way or another. Um, all, the, uh, all the horrific deeds of, of mankind need to be dealt with. God is just, right? He, he needs to uh, abolish this, this sin. It needs to be punished and, uh, and done away with. But at the same time, he's merciful. And so he loves you and he knows you're not perfect. He knows you cannot be perfect. But he's looking for people who are, are willing to, to follow him. And basically, he's offered his, his gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. So Jesus died on the cross um, to pay the price. God himself took the price of sin on himself. That's the way he can be both uh, merciful and just at the same time, and uh, so it's the it's we're saved by grace is the unmerited favor of God. It's not what we deserve; it's uh, His gift to us, and we receive that gift by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, and that means turning away from your old way. Of, of life, not trusting in yourself, not trusting in your own goodness, but turning to the goodness of Jesus Christ and knowing that um, that he paid the price of your sin. So when he died on the cross, you know, um, he, he actually took the wrath of God in himself, the wrath for all of your sin. Uh, he offered himself up as the perfect lamb without spot or blemish the Passover lamb, even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Um, the whole Old Testament sacrificial system of uh, lambs and things like that was pointing to Jesus Christ. It was a symbol. And in fact, the entire law and prophets was all pointing to Jesus Christ and it is all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So we're no longer under the law sin shall not be your master you are no longer under the law but under grace those who are in, in christ and um jesus christ um being our perfect passover lamb he was actually crucified at, on the passover and at the exact time that they were sacrificing the passover lambs um, and then jesus christ our true passover was being cr uh, crucified for us it's very symbolic, it's poetic, it's beautiful. It's put together, you know, God's plan and story is put together in a way that is beautiful and it makes sense. Once you see through the, the eyes, the lens of, of Christ, then it all makes sense. Then you can understand 
the Old and New Testament and how it all fits together, and that it was a God's plan of redemption from start to beginning, or from beginning to end. His, his plan of redemption was in Christ, and that it was all pointing to Him. And it's quite beautiful, really. And so, um, having such a great salvation offered to us, uh, we simply need to put our faith in Jesus Christ. How do you do that? Um, well, you choose that your hope, you choose to identify with Christ, you choose to follow Him, take up your cross daily, yes, and you, you put your hope in Him. You know, you acknowledge that your only, your only chance of salvation is, is Jesus Christ and what He did for you on the cross at Calvary. And it's not in yourself to be good. There's no amount of goodness that you can do to add to what Christ has already done. And so that's it. You put your faith in Him. Trust in Him. And uh, I guarantee you God is watching. And He will reveal Himself to you when you do that. Uh, Romans 8 talks about the Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. And it's only the, um, the people who have the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside them that are the children of God. So that's something that happens right now in this life for the, the believer in Christ. It's not a theoretical thing that happens in the future. It happens now. It's a tangible thing so that you know you can have absolute assurance that your sins are forgiven, that you have new life in Christ. And, then, and that's a beautiful thing. That puts meaning and purpose in your life, and it gives you hope and peace and joy that does not depend on the world around you. It depends on your connection with God, uh, knowing that you have that salvation. So, so that's the way it happens, and that's the way you can be counted as one of the good, you know, one of the good fish that gets saved. Uh, instead of being thrown into the fiery furnace. And so I hope you can take uh, some comfort in that. And uh, we're going to pray here in just a minute. But um, it's something that that's the all-important question. Um, you know, do you know Christ? Does Christ know you? Is he your Savior? Is Jesus Christ your Savior? That's the only question that you need um, to be able to say, yes, Jesus Christ is my Savior, and I know Him, and I know I'm saved, then your life is an absolute success, and you will, you're you going to shine like the <laughs> stars forever, like the, the Bible describes um, in heaven. It's going to be beautiful and glorious. And so it'll all be worth it, believe me. Um, and we want to, of course, keep learning, keep studying the Bible, and sharing our faith with others. And uh, let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for this sermon. Please help us to be better Christians. Help us to, uh, to really put our faith in Jesus Christ and trust him and what he's done for us on the cross, that our salvation is in him and him alone. And please uh, fill us with the Holy Spirit as Christians, as, as your people, as your children, God. And confirm to us that we are saved. And please also... Help us to be your good and faithful servants to carry on the Great Commission and spread our faith for, to others. Let us be your good witnesses and help us to be able and willing and able to teach others and equip them um, in discipleship. So please use us in this process and uh, strengthen your church and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.